Our first presenters are, are from Bangladesh. So I'm very pleased to, to be able to welcome Dr. Shah Ali Akbar Ashrafi, who is the chief of the Inform Health Information Unit uh, for the Ministry of Health in Bangladesh, as well as Kanat Hanan Khan, my apologies, uh, with his Bangladesh to, to share their work on the um, integrated surveillance platform and strengthening of the COVID-19 system in the country. So I believe it is over to Hanan to share his screen. So welcome to the session. Thanks, Rebecca. So uh, Dr. Ashrafi, we'll start right now. <laughs> can you see my screen? Rebecca, can yes, you see? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me in this session. That is the National COVID-19 System of Bangladesh. Uh, that is the DHS to surveillance package and the PO. Next, please. Uh, you know that the Bangladesh is a small country near about 147,000 plus square kilometer uh, of area with 160 million population and mostly dense, mostly dense country in the world. And when the COVID-19 outbreak began in December 2019, health officials of Bangladesh and development partners are getting ready under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister and after the first COVID-19 case detected on March uh, 8 in Bangladesh, Minister of Health and Family Welfare realized, uh, realized just that the need for an integrated COVID-19 system and accordingly his Bangladesh are stepped into uh, for the assistance. And initially started as COVID-19 surveillance system, the national COVID-19 system now serving as a core COVID-19 data platform for the COVID-19 related informations and playing a vital role in controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, please. The, now the highlights of the integrated COVID-19 in system of Bangladesh. All the COVID-19 informations in one place, including the, our vaccination program related uh, to the COVID-19, ICU and the associate logistics. More than 6 million tests already done and counting and COVID-19 samples are collected and being entered in the system from the more than 1000 public and private sample collection facilities and hospitals. Those are tested through 126 PCR test laboratories, 46 gene expert lab and 356 rapid antigen test facilities and data are entered into the system. The test results are notified to the suspects through SMS automatically from the surveillance system immediately after test done. And a self-service report printing system is also available in our DGHS web portal. And providing the COVID-19 certificates with secured electronic verification system, that is the QR code, and the test certificate validation are integrated and being widely used by the civil aviation authority, port and airlines and immigration authorities worldwide. The test results and certificates are providing within 48 hours for the outbound travelers. Epidemiological, epidemiological analysis, geo distribution and GIS are providing critical aid to the policymakers to make various decisions and feeding the national COVID-19 dashboard portal uh, in DGSS uh, of Minister of Health and Family Welfare, and also to the Honorable Prime Minister Safish. Thanks. So please, Mr. Anand Khan, we continue. Thank you, Dr. Asha. So let's, here's the background. The COVID surveillance system of Bangladesh is based on the actually DHS2 COVID-19 package, which is developed by University of Oslo. His Bangladesh customized it for uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Bangladesh, on the base of national requirement by consultation with the National COVID-19 Technical Committee uh, and the DGHS experts. The first version was released in March 2020. Uh, though deployed as a surveillance system, His Bangladesh were requested to help on various COVID-19 issues to support distance support system, public awareness, 
prevent forgery of testing in testing additional system components are built upon dhs2 which is now being used as a core dhs core covid 19 system so this is not actually a uh, whole dhs2 we build upon many components on the dhs2 so this this system is continuously updated and supported by his bangladesh team at the beginning, these systems financed by his Bangladesh only, later from August 2020, was partly funded by UNICEF. His Bangladesh is uh, the key support and implementation team for national HMIS based on DHS2. Few of them are uh, among the largest implementation in the world. For example, our MNCH tracker are now have more than 48 million entities. So some technical highlights. So the main components of the whole COVID-19 ecosystem uh, is the COVID case-based surveillance system using DHS2. Uh, this also include the vaccination status, vaccine logistics or VLMIS. Initially, we started with the AstraZeneca, but later on, uh, more vaccine are coming up in Bangladesh. So now it's total four vaccine types of vaccine are available. Already, uh, we asked to be ready for the four types of vaccination. COVID-19 hospital status, including ICU and associated logistics. Uh, it's also included quarantine and isolation status. COVID-19 certification for our bound travelers with secured verification and validation. Uh, alternative reporting system with, uh, with validation for port and immigration with a near real-time reporting data backup system. This is due to if the DHS is unavailable, then, uh, then the immigration will not stop. So that's the idea is, even the DHS2 system unavailable for a moment, for an hour, half an hour, by this time, this uh, data backup system actually pushing the same, the report data to the that system. So they're actually two parallel system. One is that is backing up the main DHS2 component. So in next diagram, we'll see that in the process flow, more than uh, 1,020 sample collection facilities and uh, 528 test laboratories, not only from public means from the government is also from the private facilities and commercial facilities are also there. Though not all are entering in the DHS2, few are entering in Excel, which later we import to the PHP based system. So we make a generic API interface middleware, which is designed to facilitate integration with different systems, apps, and pre formatted Excel sheets. The test results are notified to the uh, suspects through SMS automatically from the uh, from uh, the our DHS2 surveillance system immediately after the result is entered. A QR validation and validation system is integrated within the DHS2 system for security validation and verification. Uh, a self-service reporting printing option. Also, uh, we provided through the OTP so that people can take their own report from anywhere they want. So this actually reduced the load on the facility as well as uh, as well as reduce the peoples to come to the facility. So there will be uh, to prevent the COVID uh, uh, transmission. Providing COVID certificates with secured electronic verification QR code make them uh, acceptable locally and internationally by the airlines and immigrations. So this is actually uh, we uh, in a communication with our Minister of Foreign Affairs to uh, to broadcast to the all over the all immigration and airlines other. So this is actually the flow. So it's a bit complicated. So in the center, this is the DHS2 system, which is the our standard DHS2 package, what we customize for the Bangladesh. But Upon that, we build many systems. So that is a .NET system self-service reporting system, which is actually for the report distribution. The report verification keyword, this is actually bi bi-directional means that uh, from DHS2, the data is sent to the keyword, that the generate a keyword and embed in the DHS2. And same as well as support for the reporting system and the immigration for the verification validation. And we have a backup system for near real time. So this now we set up and for each 15 minutes, they backed up the, the new addition or any update of the test result to that system through the SQL script. This is done automatically. Each 15 minutes, they are synchronizing this data, test data from that server. So uh, anytime, if 
the DHS2 system is down, that system can back up the all external systems and the immigration and the ports so that there will be no chaos. So to facilitate all those, we have a medular application. Those actually uh, initially play a crucial role. When the pandemic started, there is a lot of enthusiastic uh, app development. So we have near about 300, more than 300 Android, iOS, uh, uh, Windows app and webs based self-service systems. Uh, there is a, for the screening app and there is few sample app is coming up. So we build a national Corona care gateway. So through that is data come to the middleware from the middleware go to the sample collection and this come to the main COVID-19 surveillance system. So there is private facilities they are sending through the Excel based system. So this actually compared to the PHP based system to there, but this, this actually gradually reduced and uh, we are gradually shifting to whole thing to the DHS. So on the right hand side, you see the public health, uh, public hospital, private hospital and private laboratories, public laboratories, all are reporting through the DHS2 systems right now. So this actually the data feed into the many uh, subsystems uh, or dashboard. So the uh, the most important is the Honorable Prime Minister's dashboard. So that she is aware of what is happening in the COVID situation. Also the national COVID dashboard and real-time COVID dashboard in our DHS system. So what is the challenges? So there is a lot of challenges. First challenge is the moving target. The continuously changing of requirement is actually make a thing quite difficult for us. Some of the labs and hospital have difficult, different types of systems and they don't want to use the new system. So that is also a problem. Uh, almost every day there is a new app for the COVID. So we make a middleware. So who wants to send through their, from their system? So we have the middleware application to integrate. So uh, recently we have uh, directly integrated with the DHS2 system with a few, uh, a few labs which have high volume of the lab test data. Due to the change in requirement, uh, keeping historical data and metadata clean is become a very challenging for us. Identification of a tracked entity is challenged as the government decide to mobile, use mobile, mobile number as one of the uh, uh, key identifiers. And one mobile can be used by a family. So that's also a challenge. Visualization requests are not uh, available on in DHS2. So we make several portals to visualize the data as they want. Huh. So deciding on the attribute data element for analysis, so this is also challenging because you are, you are aware, aware that attribute and multi uh, data element for multiple stages is not yet possible. Tracker performance issue is the most challenging part for us. So we overcome many th uh, the challenges by developing the API platform, National Corona Care Gateway, which actually make a middleware for the every external application. For immunization sort of app, we actually have the data entry process right now, but in future we'll do through the API when the their side the API will be available. Available, we make the integration. Test certificate. So there is a several of, uh, counterfeit uh, claim companies has come up. So we have embedded the DJ QR system, which is PHP based and the JavaScript embedded in the DHS2 with the secured government uh, from subdomains so that the, that has authenticity of the validation of that specific certificate. So ensure system availability to airlines and immigration. So that's, we already said that that's will has a backup uh, reporting system so that if the DHS2 uh, unavailable for a few minutes, hours, then it's not, not a problem. Minute warning. So this the, yes. Yeah, thank you. So this is some example of the external visualization. And finally, the acknowledgement. The DHS2 system performance is a more than 5.8 billion tracked entity was a huge challenge. We are incredibly grateful to the University of Oslo team, especially Bob, Marcus, Jubair, uh, Sandbold, uh, Luciano, and others. Uh, this initiative was initially funded by HISP, but later on funded by UNICEF. So we are also grateful to, grateful to them. Government of Bangladesh, especially Director General of Health Service, officials, Minister of Health, Minister of ICT, and the Telecommunication, the Grameen Fund. 
We are also grateful to his team because they are giving support 24 seven because without that 24 seven support is become actually very challenging for us to uh, support government of Bangladesh. So thank you everyone. In time. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashrafi, Ashrafi and Hanan. We really appreciate you taking the time to share the, the complexity and just the, the impressive rollout, uh, more than 6 million tests and this uh, national architecture. Um, so the next presentation, uh, we have um, colleagues from representing from Indonesia. So we have Taufik Sitombul Saifira, Salsabila, and Lalo Liam. Uh, the floor is yours for your presentation on contact tracing. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, uh, we are from Indonesia. We focus on uh, contact tracing COVID-19 platform in Indonesia. So next, uh, Lian. So uh, the team of, of Indonesia, we uh, contribute and uh, have contribution for MOS, especially for Infection and Emerging Disease Unit and Data and Information Center, WSO Indonesia, and this is two Indonesian team. Uh, we are many teams and uh, me, Toby Stumble and Yon Bra. Next. Okay, so platform for contact tracing uh, COVID-19, we call it like Indonesian's uh, local language, Silacak, it means tracking. And uh, this is the DSS2 uh, platform. And uh, why DSS2 and why Silacak? So that's why there has been three times changed by adjusting the SOP, especially from the uh, minister regulation. And this is to include it to adding metadata and justify for that. This is two as a platform. So this is the uh, Indonesian's uh, uh, implementations and national wide. So hosted and managed by MOH in data and information center and uh, national and regional user. And we uh, spare the contribution to national report contact tracing, especially for the MOH and national task force. Next. So what is the COVID-19. So this is the domain of a platform, especially for the COVID-19. We already uh, built and uh, uh, success to build, we call it like the WhatsApp bot. So you can uh, see later the explanation, WhatsApp bot to register new user and new uh, stakeholders to use the uh, this is too. So this is very important and uh, we can discuss later. We contribute to national ID system integration. So that's why uh, national ID just enters to the uh, DSS2 and get the attribute, many attribute for national ID system. And, and uh, we reduce the, uh, the cost of time of the data entry. So it's very important. So the second, we, the third point, we contribute to integration, the red uh, line co contribute to uh, cases system integration, we call it like the additional other resource. So that's why it's very important to integrate with the uh, contact tracing. The fourth items, we built the applications uh, focus on contact tracing, Indonesian language, especially, and very, very uh, uh, small application and very easy to, to manage, especially in Indonesian context and local people and uh, uh, facility type user. And the five, we built the Android packets. We uh, didn't use the, uh, this is two packets. We built from the, from the scratch using the, especially from the uh, mobile technology and especially to, to reduce the uh, confusing from the, this is two person and non this is two person at the facility and the so or PSO level. In the last, we implement superset uh, dashboard, uh, especially to make a real time uh, data connectivity uh, presenting. All application is connect with the this is two uh, system or uh, uh, dashboard. 
here we uh, we will uh, share the information of the two cases, especially the WhatsApp bot because like self registrations, and the second we contribute the knowledge uh, implementations, especially to uh, uh, support the local of user. The other application you can see and join to the next session like a buzzer or another discussion. Next, yeah. So. The implementation, we start from November and uh, uh, March 2021 because the group of users is very, very, very uh, changed. And so that's why it's very, uh, uh, implementation is very small. We had been the 10 province and now from April until the next, the total users is uh, 28,000 and we build, we implement in 30 provinces. And uh, we receive many additional users from police officer and military officer as the contact tracer. So next, we can continue for the next pres presentations. Next, Leah. Uh, Leah. So our friends from here, we will introduce and present about knowledge hub and registration system. Over to you, Sebira. Okay, uh, thank you for Mr. Taufik. Hello everyone, my name is Shefira. So for the next, we're gonna talking about the Knowledge Hub. Uh, so what is uh, the Knowledge Hub? So uh, this is how we manage the knowledge from central level and to end user. Uh, so uh, Knowledge Hub is a connecting uh, and sharing platform. This is, uh, sorry. Uh, sharing platform that is innovative and a great tool for collaboration. So the member join group for various reasons and they can clear, clearly define how they use them. Adjusting to the pandemic situation, it was complicated to mobilize throughout Indonesia by gathering a user in particular place. Therefore, the transfer of knowledge is chosen by using the online method uh, when uh, the participant can be trained in real time without considering the location as long as they can access the internet. Uh, so this one, it is uh, it to solve the internet issue. Uh, we have to record uh, the activity, create an ebook uh, or guidance in PDF format and provide the video tutorial so that uh, the user will have a signal problem can choose uh, the media uh, to study or repeat the materials. So next. Uh, we have a Knowledge Hub users and Knowledge Hub products. For the Knowledge Hub user for the national, uh, we have uh, uh, from Ministry of Health and National Task Force. And for the regional and facility, we have a district health office and public health office. Uh, so uh, the, and then local government, local security officer and facilities. Uh, so uh, we have uh, about the Knowledge Hub products, about the pro portal uh, FAQ and publication, training server, and activity user from many groups. Uh, the digital learning material possess a uh, ubiquitous and robust nature uh, that potentially allow more efficient facilitation of knowledge transfer and other uh, advantage compared to traditional face-to-face -face learning materials. Next. So uh, what is lesson learned? We can, uh, for the first, uh, about the technical obstacle and management constraint. It's about the many incoming requests from user and, and constraint. So the, the second is about the user constraint that are often faced is about the need uh, fast response to face the user and repetition of the session because of new user and user paradigm. And the uh, last is about the connection can run offline and online. So to solve the issue, we have a record activity, uh, create a creative ebook in PDF format so that the user will have a signal problem, uh, can choose the media study. The digital learning material uh, poses ubiquitous and robust nature that potentially allow more efficient uh, facilitation of knowledge transfer and other advantage compared uh, to traditional face-to-face -face learning materials. So uh, for the next slide, uh, will be presented by my friend, Mr. Lulian, time is yours. Thank you. 
thank you, uh, Shapira. Uh, okay, hi everyone. My name is uh, Lalu Lian. Uh, so I will be uh, sharing about one system we build, uh, registration system. We call the Amica. Amica is a WhatsApp bot for the user registration. So this the system make uh, easy uh, who want to have the access for a DS two as the one the main platform for the computer research. Uh, sorry, the motivation is the since April twenty twenty one uh, by the change the police the ending uh, didn't grow the user. Uh, the user can request uh, for have this. Uh, we have the help desk uh, have the people help the user to create like a troubleshooting or the create the account request can reach uh, 4300 uh, and uh, to 950 for the user request uh, for every day so if we create the manually it's so hard so that's why we create the one simple uh, product we use the whatsapp box because uh, in Indonesia, literacy digital is still uh, not very good. So we make uh, use the WhatsApp bot because the easy the, for the people in Indonesia uh, use the WhatsApp. So the, the, this is the process. Uh, the process that the, I will be explaining it the first times. Uh, our headless can uh, make the code Unicode uh, uh, based on uh, user role and a group. So the invitation will be created uh, by a system and we send to the new users and uh, they will be uh, they will be a registration use the invitation. So after that, after they following uh, the direction based on uh, SOP, and uh, based uh, the system we create the manually, uh, sorry, we create the base system, they can get the account uh, two and three minutes after they follow the, the process. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the, this is the, what's the look the our uh, system, Amica, self registration. You can uh, see in the, the uh, the ones is the how do we create the invitations invitation and uh, and the the feature second picture we you can uh, see how uh, the process the one the process from the a new user use the self registration uh, and we have uh, the dashboard the dashboard uh, like the monitoring and so how many user for every this uh, every provincial we can look on and pointing where the position okay uh, so uh, the from the listener on uh, we see uh, because the problem in indonesia is still load for the digital iteration so we find uh, many uh, new user can uh, have the error waiting for the standard password and the uh, error to share location use the WhatsApp. So for the this the problem, we uh, improve the system, uh, make uh, like the notification if they get the wrong, uh, like the password that they not use our standard. And we make the video guides step by step the product for a user. And the next step, we uh, make the new SAP registration, but now we enable registration, we use the webs. So uh, that's for me. Uh, thank you. Rebecca, over to you. So much. Thank you so much to the team for sharing these incredible innovations and particularly around being able to reach and expand um, the support networks to users. I think that's just a really fascinating story for many of our implementers here. So our um, next presenter, I will invite, uh, please, Dr. Talia Shargai, who's the EIS fellow uh, from um, USCDC, who will give us a presentation on um, challenges implementing DHIS2 for the COVID-19 response within the South Sudan context. So please welcome uh, Talia.
Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Kalia Shragai with the CDC and the United States, and I'll be presenting on an evaluation of the implementation of a DHIS2 COVID-19 module in South Sudan based on work with my co-authors from CDC and the South Sudan Ministry of Health listed here. South Sudan is a landlocked country in Eastern Africa. Its capital is Juba. It gained independence in 2011, making it the world's youngest country. Since independence, South Sudan has suffered protracted civil strife and humanitarian emergencies, including food insecurity, outbreaks, and flooding. The Ministry of Health has very limited human and financial resources and primarily relies on NGOs and donors. The Emergency Operations Center was activated in March 2020, and the first COVID-19 case was identified in South Sudan on April 6, 2020. And between then and June 13th of this year, they've recorded close to 11,000 cases and 115 deaths, with peaks in May to June of 2020 and January to March of 2021. This shows the structure of the high-level COVID-19 response in South Sudan. I'm not showing this to walk through every piece, but to highlight how multi-layered it is. The response is based in the Public Health Emergency Operations Center in Juba. Shown in the top three boxes are the several Ministry of Health committees coordinating the response. And the middle row shows the technical working groups in charge of aspects of the response from points of entry to case management to logistics. Shown below the technical working groups are partners that implement the response work. Reporting and decision-making is a cumbersome process. Each technical working group overseen by the Ministry of Health is comprised of different implementing partners, each on its own funding cycle with its own internal objectives and processes. The exact number of implementing partners is difficult to report because there is a lot of turnover. At the moment, there are at least 10 partners actively implementing COVID response in South Sudan. There are five sources that feed into the COVID-19 surveillance system. These include points of entry, testing people entering the country, a network of sentinel site health clinics conducting testing, an alert hotline where symptomatic people can call in and have a rapid, re and have a rapid response team come to them for COVID testing, pre-travel testing for people leaving South Sudan and requiring negative COVID certificate for their destination, and a contact tracing system testing those with known exposures. For people meeting certain case criteria, a sample is collected and tested either at the National Laboratory in Juba a mobile laboratory outside of Juba or at a private lab. Any positive cases identified are managed at home or in a COVID-19 clinic based on symptom severity. Ideally, all positive cases should have their information passed to contact tracers who elicit and test all close contacts, creating a small feedback loop. Core COVID-19 data is captured beginning with a case form and lab request form. These are filled out for anyone receiving a COVID test. These films are formed on paper and attached to their sample and sent to the lab, who then prints and attaches the results to the case and lab request forms after testing. All data are sent on either on paper or via email to the Emergency Operations Center, where data management personnel enter it into the main South Sudan case database, which is maintained in Excel. Data on positive cases are sent via email to case management and contact tracing teams, who return patient outcome data to the Public Health Emergency Operations Center, either through email or a phone messaging system. South Sudan can then report total cases, total deaths, and case curves. In March 2020, South Sudan received funding to implement a COVID-19 DHIS-2 module. DHIS-2 already existed in the country as it was first developed for HIV surveillance. However, the HIV module is still under development and has not yet been implemented. Uh, DHIS2 development for COVID-19 was undertaken with the immediate goal of improving the COVID-19 response with higher quality and more accessible data, and with a longer term goal of overhauling and unifying the health information system by completely transitioning to DHIS2. The DHIS2 COVID-19 module is planned with separate forms for each group that will use the system. One for the alert hotline to screen people who potentially need to be tested, a case form and lab request form for all groups collecting COVID tests, a lab form for labs testing the samples and producing results, and a form for case management groups to report case outcomes, and finally a form for contact investigation starting from each case. Ideally, the system would be customized based on existing forms that reflect the current movement of data through the system. However, the flow shown here is highly simplified. Remember that because of how the response is structured, multiple independent implementing partners collect those da these data and there are no standardized and universally accepted data collection forms or sets of variables. 
For example, patient outcome data is collected by two different implementing partners conducting home-based care for mild cases, and at least three different implementing partners running COVID-19 clinics for more serious cases. That's a total of at least five independent groups collecting patient outcome data. Each of those five partners has developed their own internal data forms with their own variables collected and their own data management system. There's also no mandated, standardized, or regular data reporting across the system or an easy centralized way to report data. After more than a year of development, the HIS2 is still not in use for COVID-19 in South Sudan. While most of the necessary steps have been completed for each component of the DHIS2 system, system training and rollout has not yet begun. Why has this process been so hard? While I've already hinted at some of the main barriers, I'm gonna describe here important challenges that have slowed the implementation for DHIS2. I'll also talk about major successes that have come out of the development process. We evaluated the development of COVID-19 DHIS2 module in South Sudan through a series of key informant interviews to identify the most important barriers and successes. We interviewed 13 people within the Ministry of Health and among implementing partners between October 2020 and March 2021. We then synthesized common themes to better understand the development process, starting with barriers to the rollout. The first challenge identified was inadequate funding and capacity. For example, there was no funding to hire in-country backend developers or existing capacity to make modifications to the backend of DHIS2 within South Sudan and development was outsourced to part-time Tanzanian staff without first-hand knowledge of the system in South Sudan. This has led to major lags in implementing changes and difficulty communicating needs to developers who don't understand the first system in person. There's also only a single epidemiologist in South Sudan with data management training who has been hired to work on DHIS2, which is insufficient to facilitate and manage the development process. And he also has no back-end uh, training to be able to develop the system. This has meant that changes to the DHIS2 backend happen slowly with variable quality. To address these issues, there's been a push to train technical staff in South Sudan to manage the backend, and the Tanzanian developers were brought to South Sudan for two months to work in country. The second challenge identified is limited buy-in and willingness to share data across the implementing partners. It's been a struggle to convince partners to share data when there's no precedent to do so, to switch from a data management system they already use and know, and to take time out of their already busy days to actively participate in the process. Even getting responses to emails can be difficult. This is exacerbated by high partner turnover as garnering buy-in has to start from the beginning each time a new partner enters the space. Even when the Ministry of Health is ready to proceed, lack of partner participation has slowed things down. To help address this, the Ministry has started implementing weekly group meetings with the data focal person from each technical working group to create accountability and space for regular communication. Third, as I mentioned, each implementing partner has their own non-standardized data system. Even when partners are willing to transition to DHIS2, data are often not interoperable or easy to share. For example, there are three forms here. Uh, the three forms shown here all show different versions of the case investigation form that should be filled at time of testing, all different, asking different questions with different sets of variables. This has added a large complicated step to the implementation process as the ministry and partners had to agree on standardized forms and variables that all parties would use. It's been a long iterative collaborative process to arrive at standardized forms and variables. Finally, South Sudan has poor infrastructure, security and resources outside of Juba. It's difficult to implement DHIS2 when you can't tell how a state's current process operates and visiting rural location, it's, locations is often difficult due to lack of roads lockdowns and security concerns. Even communicating virtually is hampered by unreliable internet and phone service. Additionally, resources are spread even more thinly outside Juba and other priorities often take precedence over COVID surveillance. For example, addressing immediate flooding concerns as shown in this photo here or impending famine. This has led to the role of DHIS2 being concentrated in Juba. Although with COVID restrictions looser now, travel outside Juba has begun with the goal of expanding COVID-19 surveillance. Now I'll talk about uh, some of the exciting successes that have come out of the implementation process as well. First is the creation of a Ministry of Health Data Management Unit. This is the first time the Ministry of Health has had a dedicated da data management unit and has created the infrastructure for more regular coordination of health data through a central system. The Ministry of Health has dedicated full-time personnel to data management. A couple of the key people are photographed below and is making a long-term commitment to building stronger central health information system. 
Second, the process of implementing DHIS-2 has forced the Ministry of Health and partners to build up capacity. Training has begun so the Ministry of Health staff can maintain the backend DHIS-2 system. The process of participating in the DHIS-2 development has led to improved data management capacity among implementing partners. And funding for DHIS-2 has supported modernization of data collection forms from paper to tablets and funded personnel within the Ministry of Health for the data management unit. And third, this process has set an important precedent that health data in South Sudan can be more centralized and standardized. The Ministry of Health has taken major steps in playing a more central role in collecting and coordinating national health data. Through this process, the Ministry has now taken steps to mandate st standardized data, regular reporting, and reporting through a centralized system. Inclusions, while the DHIS2 COVID-19 module is a powerful system for surveillance data management, Rapid implementation requires minimum prerequisites that South Sudan just did not have. These include in-country technical capacity for backend development, stakeholder buy-in to use the system, a sufficient number of trained human resources. However, the process of implementing DHIS2 has helped build capacity and data infrastructure in South Sudan and is a worthwhile investment for improving public health surveillance, even in countries with these challenges. And uh, update the current target rollout date for the DHIS2 system in the country is July 1st, so just in a couple of weeks. Thank you to all the support I received from the Ministry of Health and to all my co authors. Thank you, Talia, for sharing this, this incredible story. I think it's so important for us. Um, to remember all of the enabling factors and, and environmental factors that, that enable the, the strengthening and the rollout of these electronic systems. And I think this story around South Sudan really helps to pinpoint those challenges, but also some of the gains that you were able to make in a more systemic way, uh, despite what was happening. So we have actually, uh, we were really quite on time. Um, and we have some time for actually question and answer. If anybody uh, would like, you can feel free to just add your, your questions into the chat. We have our, our presenters here. Um, I will also take a quick look into the, to the community of practice. Um, so let's, let's see. Also feel free to raise your hands if you have a question for any of the participants here today. So I might actually start, and since you're here, Talia, um, you know, I had heard through through our HIST network around some of um, some of the work that was going into to the interoperability between the laboratory system and DHIS2, and I think we've also reached sometimes the similar types of challenges in in being able to resolve those sort of um, non technical uh, bottlenecks. And so I, I was just wondering, based on sort of the experience out of South Sudan, was there anything um, that you you would believe is is important for for other countries with similar complex operating environments, or if there were an alternative approach um, that might be able to strengthen a um, a level of system use that's perhaps uh, less complex. We do see many countries with COVID nineteen vaccine delivery kind of struggling between how to roll out uh, individual level trackers at scale versus kind of relying on some of those paper-based uh, aggregate reporting that works well. So I didn't know if you had any reflections from your field experiences. Um, I think just similar to what I already presented that um, when there were groups that really wanted to make this, this transition and they didn't have the capacity to do so, uh, we also just didn't have enough people to support them. We had to be in a million places at once. There were a ton of competing priorities. And what really needed to happen is just to have someone sit down with them, go through their system and figure out what variables need to be switched, how to make the systems interoperable, what steps need to be taken. And we just didn't have enough time or people to do that thoroughly. And having more people on our team would have made that much easier. Yeah, thanks for reinforcing that point. I think we talk so much about interoperability and we have uh, a session after this one actually today and also uh, I believe tomorrow. Um, and one of the things that uh, we often run into is, is sort of this 
kind of top down standards based approaches and sometimes we forget uh, the very, very basics around um, actually knowing what our data variables are and are they consistent across different systems and how do they map to one another. Um, so to me that's a really great reminder. Um, let's see. I don't know if we have Hanan still on the line. Hanan, are you still here? No, I think he actually he probably had to move. I know this is in the middle of their um, transition time, moving moving back from work. Are you still here, Hanan? I see your name. Okay, perhaps not. Ah, you cannot unmute. Let's see. Actually, yes, time. now I can unmute. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm here. I, I realized I, I cut you a little bit short because I was worried about time, but we actually ran out of a presenter. So I just wanted to ask if there was anything we felt that uh, we rushed you through on your experiences in Bangladesh. Hello. Yes. So uh, if there is no question uh, uh, for, for COVID related issues, we actually has a, the, you, you see our challenges, the moving target. The capacity is also one another area where actually we're facing significant number of huge challenges. For example, when it's come to the DHS, the training requirement is uh, very minimal because DHS2 all, all over the country, they know what is DHS2, but the private facilities and the outside, the government facilities, the new user. So what we did, we make an online training for two hours in the night so that they can they, they can teach on the DHS2. But the problem is uh, the sustainability long term. So initially what we, uh, with the help of UNFPA and UNICEF, we recruited uh, data entry operators for helping them and gradually is take out from uh, those data entry operators to handing over those the systems to the government. But still government is struggling to recruit and to uh, facing the data entry and the interpretation challenge. So there are actually uh, several uh, recruiting process. For example, the government doctor recruiting process actually bring forward and try to recruit a set of doctors in the field as well as uh, which has the informatics background to place it with us. So this is actually government tried to minimize. And we also try to minimize to recruit uh, through the donors. For example, uh, the DFID, uh, there's a UK aid, uh, UNFPA, World Bank, ADB. So all are helps to recruit short-term people so that uh, we can uh, intermediately uh, help those people. But at the system end, we always have a problem to hand over the systems gradually. Also, the funding support for his also running out in June. So this is, a, uh, but the the most difficult is the chance. So if there is a chance that we need it tonight, so which is impossible. So they have to understand that this need time and carefully uh, check with the earlier data uh, effect how we implement and how we affect the system. So we need to test this test is first with our test environment. And this takes some time. So understanding those is very difficult, especially in the political and in the media, because this uh, anything happen wrong is going to the media. Okay, we not get report two hours delay. We have to waiting in the queue, etc. So we try to minimize in technically. For example, the report printing. We are not tracking a record printing from the facility, so they can report print anywhere they want. We ensure that their QR is embedded, so certificate validity. So when we started by remotely printing, they are actually, uh, they come, they, some, uh, some people come up with the four certificates that change the name, picture and everything. So put it in for their own. So we have to put the QR embed with the government, our government subdomain so that uh, every QR is verified from that. So that's how we try to mitigate. So it's not, uh, there is a thumb rule of how you mitigate that. So when the challenge came, you have to find a way out how to, why you want to mitigate and how fast you want to. That's my suggestion. And for the, uh, the, 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 the last uh, 
presented what the manpower human resource challenge. There is technical challenge and non-technical challenge. Non-technical challenge, there's a, some mitigation way. For example, in laboratory, we set them to record in the paper and send the paper to the later on to the res, to the system. But the sending the paper is sometimes very difficult because lab doesn't want to send any anything outside because if the people know, they, if they go to the media, so this kind of issues. So technical and non-technical, both challenges are there, but human resource in the government sector is a really very, very challenging and very difficult to mitigate. Thank you, Hanar. Uh, we appreciate that um, extra, extra few words based on your many, many years supporting Bangladesh and in the field. Um, I do have a question from Jim in the chat. Um, I think this is directed to South Sudan, um, but the need for DHIS2 backend development. So I think perhaps this was maybe just a clarification of what, what type of support. Is it um, maybe the, the core functionality, the, the database uh, itself, um, the middleware development, or is it simply configuring the DHIS2 system? I'm not sure if Talia, if the question is clear, if you're able to speak to that or not. Yeah, I can tell that nobody on our team has a uh, capacity for backend development because we use the word backend development when uh, clearly there are many words for different pieces of this. Uh, but we mean just configuring the DHIS2 system. So what would happen repeatedly is a system would get uh, customized. We do a review of it. We come up with all of these things that we need to be adjusted or changed. And then the process to actually get those changes made would take a month, six weeks. And uh, it just was too slow for things to happen um, in any kind of reasonable timeline. Very clear. So that makes, makes a lot of sense. I'm sure that's a familiar challenge. Um, Taufik uh, and our Indonesian colleagues, did you have any last words? Um, and then we can close in two minutes and uh, have a little transition time. But uh, Taufik, any, anything else to add before we close the session or Lalu? Yeah, I have a question to Taufik. Uh, hi, Alan. Yes, yeah, Taufik. I, I, I... So I, Sorry, I, want to, uh, I want to add something about the uh, implementations. We, uh, we implement, uh, uh, new new model of implementation, especially to engage uh, technology and synchronize what uh, MOS uh, does, especially to real time data and uh, connect with the uh, new technology like uh, database. Rebecca? Thank you. Hanan, last word or? No, uh, a question to topic. Because the contact tracing, how uh, they implement in Indonesia, uh, I see uh, uh, the WhatsApp integration. So how you work with the WhatsApp as a support system. For example, in our system, we use WhatsApp as a support platform. So we have a Facebook support platform for various, but for a specific COVID, we have WhatsApp support group for the supporting the all user, end user, field user. So anything uh, problem, they, mess, they type in the WhatsApp and a specific person will attend there. But you're, you're using WhatsApp, I see your presentation. So what actually, how you use that actually? So this, yeah. is there any technical integration from your side? You're just, just using simple WhatsApp. Yeah, uh, we are using WhatsApp, but it's meant to support what the supervisor or MOH uh, uh, request from the facility and the XO. So that's why it's the like automatic uh, boot if uh, based on the request from from uh, facility and users, and uh, they, we have been integrate, we use the web API especially uh, connect with the API what the function need, especially if the registration system, we connect with the API for the user creations, user group and user roles, and user uh, organization unit, for example. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah. Hanan, did you get? Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Well, a huge thanks to to our presenters. I just find this work um, just so impressive. It takes many years to really stand up strong uh, surveillance systems. And seeing all of this uh, local innovation to, to strengthen COVID-19, I am sure is going to translate into strengthening the overall uh, integrated electronic uh, systems and be able to really, to really reach into more timely reporting and better data use and, and better coverage, even, even in complicated environments. So I thank you all to the presenters. With this, we can um, close this particular session. I think the Zoom will stay open for the next session in line. Uh, but at this point, Max, I think we can stop the recording.